How many of you have watched Black Panther? By show of hands, please. So quite a number of you. For me, this is one of my all-time favorite movies. It's not just because it's set up in a world where Africa leads the world in innovation and technology that appeals to my the Pan-African in me, or because in numerous occasions I have been confused with Chadwick Boseman. <laughs> <laughs> but the reason why Black Panther resonated with me this much was because of who the black superhero represented for me. My father. You see, a superhero should have three fundamental qualities. A superhero should be powerful and strong. And my dad was a fast body. I believed if there was ever a wrestling match, he would beat all the dads in the estate plus the ones from the next estate. <laughs> a superhero knows a lot, and so did my dad. My dad is probably the person who the phrase know it all refers to. And third, a superhero is present, always there, always there for the rescue and my dad was there. My dad was a present dad when I grew up. I was born and raised in Rongo, South Nyanza, now Migori County. Ours was a very small family. We did not have the wherewithal to live a lavish lifestyle, but once rarely knocked on our door. Both my parents were teachers. So when my dad decided to de quit the teacher service commission and join the NGO world, it was very welcome because with it came a different lifestyle. He had to travel for work. He'd travel and often he'd return over the weekends and often bearing gifts. I looked forward to those, those times. He'd walk us to church on Sundays or I remember we'd often take a walk, just me and him, to the town center to buy newspapers. I would ask him, I'd bombard him with so many questions, and he always had an answer to those questions. I relished these times, and I looked forward to when he would return over the weekend. But then, things started changing, slowly but surely. He, would, he started coming every fortnightly, then once a month. And when he'd come, because he'd come from such a long trip, he'd be so tired and sleep in. He started sending me for the newspapers instead of us going together to buy the newspapers. And he'd read them in his bedroom. This change was slow but certain for a boy who lived for the weekends. During this time, my parents' marriage took a beating. I reckon the distance did not help. When dad would return, they would have subtle, not so subtle quarrels. And this would overshadow the joy of having him in the house. Things would change. My mom would be in a foul mood. He would be in a foul mood. And then he would leave and only come back at night. And slowly, I was losing touch with my superhero, my Black Panther. I remember once, in 2005, my dad, my sister and I were riding with my dad in his car. We sat at the back, and on the co-driver's side, there was a lady. This lady looked very familiar. I had seen her before. Her and dad giggled and laughed and chatted as we drove along. Then he pulled over. I can't remember for what, but he just pulled over. 
and looked back at us. And so did the lady. Then, after a brief introduction between my sister and I and the lady, he said, Ma Mama Umatin, which means in the heavenly language, <laughs> this is your stepmom. I felt a sharp pain in my heart, and I felt difficulty in breathing. I was shivering, probably out of cold, but till my back was soaked in sweat. For what must have been just a few seconds felt like so many hours to me. I was jolted back to reality when he asked, Donge, which means, is it? Is it okay? I had no choice. I nodded, not knowing to what question I was nodding to, to what I was agreeing to. A very false sense, a false sense of participation and democracy, as if I had consented to his decisions. Then, with a big smile on his face, he turned and cranked the engine. The lady turned too. The kids, they continued laughing, and which was a lot louder now, and giggled, which was a lot more annoying. <laughs> I was bombarded with so many questions. So what happens to mom? What happens? Do we see you now or you're gone? But by far the question I wanted most answered, I needed an answer to, was what happens? to my superhero. In the separation, mom found her way to the United States, and we had to move in with my dad and my stepmom. That meant a move from Rongo to Nairobi. Dad walked outside the country, so he wasn't there anyway. And then began my struggles. You see, in my tiny little brain, I rationalized that if my own father can just leave, because that's what it seemed to me, then no one else can love me. I was unworthy of love. So many things were happening at this, at this time. First, I had to deal with adolescents at that time. Second, I had to deal with the fact that I felt rejected, dejected, and abandoned by my father. But most of all, I quickly found that this town can be quite harsh to a village boy with a Luo accent. <laughs> and not a single word of sheng in his vocabulary. So teenage, for me, was a struggle, because I struggled for attention and validation, love and affection from anyone who was there. Mom was not around, dad was out of the country, and the times that he'd come, he'd have so many other important things to do. And he never seemed to get to me. When I, when I joined Form 4, when I moved on to Form 4 is when I started growing tall. I used to be very short, and we, I had a soprano then. <laughs> True story. So when I grew taller, I stood out even more. I needed someone to tell me that the turmoil that my family was going through was more common than it was rare that other people were going through much worse. But most importantly, I needed someone to tell me I was worthy of love. I had a few successes. 
I got to the career, my dream career, the something, something I'd wanted to do since I was seven years old. But since the validation and the congratulations did not come from my dad, it didn't matter who else thought I did great. On the 16th of September, 2015, my dad was shot by thugs. Don't worry, he's still alive. <laughs> I spent two weeks by his side every single day from 8 a.m. in the morning to sometimes even 10 p.m. at night. Every single day. I could see him suffer. A man had thought strong and didn't need any help from anyone. Now depended fully on myself and the nurses. No one ever wants to see their superhero suffer. As much as the thought of losing him terrified me, froze the blood in my veins, I still had my guards up because if he left once, he can leave again. And I knew immediately he got well. He'd leave. But then again, I decided it was worth the try because I could see him try. I could see him try to speak to me, try to get to know me better. I mean, the worst case scenario is everything remains the same. He lives. And at this point, my default setting was unworthy, unworthy of anything. And it can't really get lower than that. So we began talking. And this, ladies and gentlemen, marked a turning point in our relationship. Everything else, everything didn't all of a sudden become good. We still struggled. We still went for months without talking. But he would call sometimes. And I'd call him sometimes. We had long, hard, uncomfortable, and sometimes even awkward talks about the things he wished he'd done differently, the things he wished for me, the mistakes he admitted to have done and made. And I saw a different side of him. First, I saw someone who, when he left, when I was younger, had the most noble of intentions to provide for his family. And I understood that him, just like anyone, is prone to mistakes, which he made. But I came to realize that these same mistakes, I made them. The more I didn't want to be like my father, the more alike we were. So I came to learn not to judge someone until you have walked in their shoes. And I came to realize that it was never too late to reconnect. I have friends who talk so highly of their dads, and they lost their dads a couple of years ago, a decade ago. But here I was with an opportunity to make it better. Here I was with an opportunity to not let what happened define me. It was tough because having lived so many years not believing that I was worthy of anything, you can't just flip that switch. You can't just believe you're good enough all of a sudden. So this has been my work in progress. On the outside, I tried to portray a six foot four, 
confident man. But deep within, I still struggle with these insecurities. I'd like to introduce you to Kintsugi. Kintsugi is a Japanese art of repairing broken pottery in China with a lacquer that has ground gold, silver, or platinum. So what you get after something breaks, after your china breaks or your plate breaks, take it to a Kintsugi artist, he fixes it, but on the lines, on the broken lines, it's golden. So you, more often than not, get an even more incredible piece of art than you had before. The philosophy behind it is the brokenness and the, and the repair of an object should be part of its history and not be disregarded. And that is how I choose to see my life. My brokenness, my past, is part of me. I decide, yes, my past, my past defines me, but I decide on how it will define me henceforth. And my goal is to make something even more incredible from the bricks and line it with gold. In this work of progress, We've gotten to a point that I talk to my dad almost every week. I've learned to love, but more importantly, let's love. I have an incredible woman in my life who has taught me. I have an incredible woman in my life who has taught me not only how to love, but that I am worthy of her love. <laughs> so ladies and gentlemen, I hope I don't make this seem easy, that moving from what I used to be to what I portray myself as right now, it's not been easy, it's still a work in progress. I'd be betraying the truth if I said it was easy. But every single day I wake up to make that choice. Thank you very much. <laughs>